Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. If you would like, use the chat to let us know where you are tuning in from. Love to see where you're joining us from. And in Zoom, if you use the little drop down and choose all panelists and attendees, then everyone can see where you're tuning in from and not just Cloda and me. First Hill, hello, Patricia. Anchorage, Alaska, hello, Judith. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Bellevue, Washington, hello, Mary. Cleveland, Ohio, hello. So great. We'll give it just a few more seconds and then we will officially get started. Just let a few more of you get logged in. New York City, hello, Seattle. Wonderful. I'm actually on Whidbey Island right now. Kind of crazy, usually in Seattle. All right. So we will go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon or almost afternoon, I guess, depending on where you are. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop in Seattle that's called Book Larder. We are in Seattle's Fremont neighborhood. And typically we host lots of in-person author talks and cooking classes. And for the moment, we have taken those chats to Zoom so that we can um, continue to talk about cookbooks and all those things that we love uh, during the pandemic. One of the great parts of that, of course, has been that we are able to welcome authors like Clota McKenna today, who are you know, sort of on the other side of the world, and also welcome so many of you from different parts of the country and also from the world. Um, we are talking about Clota's brand new book, Clota's Weeknight Kitchen. Um, this is, I think it's her seventh cookbook. I know she's written at least seven. So, um, so this is um, the one that we're going to chat about today. It is, of course, available at booklarder.com. And um, you can support this author talk by um, purchasing the book from us if you are so inclined. We are going to, of course, leave some time for questions today. So if you would please use the Q&A button that you will see on your little Zoom toolbar, um, that will help me keep track of the questions as Cloda and I chat. I will get to as many of them as I possibly can, and we will um, finish up very close to 12 o'clock. All right, so without further delay, please join me in welcoming Cloda McKenna. Hello. Hello. <laughs> From your beautiful thank kitchen. You. Oh, thank you. And thank you for having me in your beautiful Book Larger event. I am so honored to be doing it via Zoom because I can't yeah. be there, obviously. Yeah, no, we're absolutely delighted to have you. And um, how, how are you doing? How am I doing? Um, I, feel like I have to ask everyone as we get started. <laughs> it's so funny. Well, do you know what? I am in the same storm as everybody zooming in tonight. I'm just on a different boat. Yeah. <laughs> we're all in the same boat, but we're doing good, thank you. Um, and we're healthy, um, touch wood. Um, and so we can't really ask for any more right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. And um, it looks like you've created such a lovely setting for yourself there. Um, and I'm sure that lots of people who um, are tuned in today have watched some of your Instagram lives over the past year from that very spot, I think. Um, so, you know, thank you for, for joining us today and for bringing us so much great um, inspiration as we've all cooked our way through this past year. Um, which brings us to your book, which is um, sort of the book that you, you created as you found yourself confined to home a little more than usual. <laughs> tell us, so tell us about sort of the inspiration um, and, and tell us about the book. Do you know what, this is definitely the most special book that I've ever written. Um, I heard in your interview you're talking about it being my seventh book and you were correct, it's my seventh book. Um, and the reason why it's so special is on the first week of lockdown, we went into lockdown at the end of March, beginning of April last year. And um, I thought to myself, what am I going to, to do to keep myself mentally stimulated, something to get up to do every day because all of my work and travel was cancelled, like literally like a domino effect every day for like three days in a row. 
And so um, I decided to do recipe videos up on my Instagram, on IGTV, every single day. Um, and Harry, my fiance, who I think is watching as well, <laughs> uh, he's over in the other house, but he's watching. Um, and he, um, he filmed them for me. So we got up every day, thought about what I was going to cook. And I was only thinking about doing maybe one or one week or something like that. But the feedback was so big from all of my followers and the following was growing really rapidly. Um, and everybody was in the same conundrum, no matter where they were in the world. I was having people, you know, messaging me from California, Australia, Canada, you know, because I do the shows over there. I do the Today Show in America and in Canada, I do the Maren Dennis show. And, and from Ireland and where I'm from and from here in the UK, asking the exact same questions. And it was all about what can I make that is fast to cook this evening? Whether there were a lot of people who were living on their own and felt very isolated um, and other people who were cooking for, you know, a house full of screaming children and who were under pressure to keep their work going. And so I started building these recipes or creating these recipes every day for Instagram. Um, and the following, my following grew, grew from like 35,000 to over 100,000 within like a couple of months. And the DMs, like the direct messages that we were getting, um, and I say we, because Harry was helping me in the evening, going through them, um, was over 300 daily um, people getting wow. in touch, asking for advice on, um, you know, they have this left, they have that left, how could they make a supper out of it? And I felt like really all of a sudden, social media turned in from something that was kind of just there at the side for me to being something really important in my life and a really positive place where I could really connect with people who had bought my previous books, new people who were kind of you know, coming on who hadn't known of me before. And we genuinely, this fantastic kind of community and repertoire started on a daily basis. And I live for it and I still live for it. And I'm so thankful for that time. And so then people were asking, where can they get all the recipes in one so they can start planning out their meals for the week? And my publisher had been watching all of this kind of rumble happening on my Instagram and then got in contact with me and said, how do you feel about writing a book? And I was like in the middle of lockdown actually probably the perfect time hadn't even thought of it. <laughs> and so I started ruffling two recipes really tuning them and and coming up with more and came up with and I really wanted to do a book that I knew that my followers would love and would need and would use and so yeah and then Claude's Weeknight Kitchen was was made and it's all about easy fast recipes that you can make during the week like I think a lot of us tuning in and, and you as well Laura I'm sure you're sorted for the weekend like we all know how to make a roast we all know how to make a kind of a you know a really fabulous like impressive you know one dish we all have one or two in our pockets that we can do mm. and so I probably have a few more but that's because it's my profession but yeah. um but I felt that that we were all really needing help with was the weeknight dilemma every single night you know, because you couldn't get takeaways. We live in the middle of the country, so we couldn't even get like deliveries. It was just, you know, something that I felt was really needed. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's where the book came to. And it's been my most successful book. I mean, by really by far. Um, yeah. It's been a number one bestseller in Ireland, and I think still is um, since it's launched, um, and here it was a bestseller, um, in Canada, it's number nine on the charts, thank you to all my Canadian followers, <laughs> um, and to, you know, bookstores like you that have come along and just supported, um, you know, people like me that really want, I mean, for me, when I look at this book, I look at this book as a book that was created solely for all of my followers on Instagram. I mean, I yeah. look at them and I remember the names and the stories of people who <laughs> me told me they were a nurse and they were exhausted and what could they cook? And I was like, oh, I have a big egg tonight and here's the recipe quickly. And, you know, so it's a really yeah, special. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you find, because obviously, you know, you cook on a weekly basis, you know, regularly. How did you find that your cooking or the needs of people that you were talking to changed because of lockdown? Like what was it um, that was different about cooking in that context? 
I think that is because the cooking became quite intense in everybody's house. So it went from like maybe cooking three times a week or twice a week or four times a week and then getting takeaways in or going out to a restaurant or having friends over where it's different type of cooking to all of a sudden it be like an occasion every single night and uh, oh my god what's for dinner starting at like five o'clock and also the intensity of trying to keep your work going or the pressures of keeping your own business going and the stress of that and the stress of everything around it the build up the, the cooking became quite an intense thing and so what I wanted to do by the videos and by this was to really just kind of like take the pressure out of it and so funny I was on the phone to my sister the other day and she was talking through you know she goes so I've, I've done this one and this one and this one this week and I said you know it's so hilarious I do the same thing like about like five o'clock and it's like dinner time I literally grab the book myself and open up and go <laughs> oh no chicken cuisine is that on tonight no that takes 30 minutes I'm going to do that on a Friday night okay what takes like 10 minutes okay I'm going to do the baked eggs with ham cream not making time because I know I'll have that prepped in 10 minutes and in the oven for 10 minutes which isn't my time or you know like my I've got leftover chicken so I'll make you know a lovely soulful chicken soup you know with green vegetables um and so that's how my my cooking has changed I, I was so focused before this lockdown on dinner parties and going out to restaurants and all the rest that I really even had to visit, revisit myself and also what ingredients you have because you just didn't want to be going out to the supermarket all the time you wanted right. to kind of get things in and and so there's a whole section in the book um, on store covered recipes so easy things you know recipes that you can make by using chickpeas and tomatoes and coconut milk and easy things that will keep for ages in your store cupboard. Yeah, yeah. And I just really quickly, if anyone joined us late, um, you are welcome to ask questions as well. Just use the Q&A button, please, for those. Um, yeah, I thought that the pantry section was really helpful. Um, if someone is sort of, you know, just getting started with this book or just starting to think about like, okay, I need to be making more than like scrambled eggs, you know, on a regular basis, <laughs> what kind of things would you encourage them to have around how should they stock their cupboard? How should they stock their cupboard? I mean, I, I have a whole section in there where I give all of the ingredients, like as in like a list of store cupboard ingredients. I think, you know, starting off with like the spices, having a great spice rack is just so key. And then filling in your spice rack with things like chili flakes um, or, you know, Dijon mustard. Like chili flakes are, are so brilliant, you know, added even you know just into like with a tin of tomatoes and some crispy pancetta add loads of those chili flakes and some garlic you know and pop it on pasta you know and you can have chicken with it or you can have fish with it or pork with it or prawns with it those things that are so fast to make or a jar of harissa became one of my best friends during lockdown as well you know that is so delicious even added to some creme fraiche you know to serve with some potato falafels or popped on top of the baked potato and maybe crumbles of feta as well on top of that. Um, Dijon mustard is like such a key thing to have as well for like adding flavor to your roast chicken by rubbing it underneath the skin and um, adding it into lots of cream sauces for gratins or um, one that I was cooking last week on a show in Canada, which is one of my like if you only have 10 minutes to cook something and you want to do a fish pie, do my fish gratin. It's called the melt in the mouth fennel and fish gratin, where it's a layering of, um, on the first layering on your, in your um, baking dish, you put thinly sliced fennel, but you could put leeks in there instead or spinach. And I talk about all those alternatives in the book. Then you just pop your fish on top and then in a measuring jug or a bowl, you just whisk together you know, Gruyere cheese or Parmesan or a cheddar with some cream, some Dijon mustard that adds so much creaminess and spice to it. Pour it all over into the oven, you know, for 20 minutes and you've got your supper made. I mean, it literally does not take more than 10 minutes to prep. Um, and uh, what else do I have my store cupboard? And I love, all, I love loads of tinned food. Like I love all the pulses like cannellini beans. When I lived in Italy, uh, I really discovered like, pulses when I lived in Italy, um, cannellini beans, 
drained, rinsed, popped into a saucepan, brushed with, you know, your mash or your rinse or your, I think you call it a ricer, don't you? Yeah. What you mash with. Potato masher, either one. Yeah. And then add in a little bit of garlic into it, olive oil and maybe some fresh rosemary and serve it with like lamb chops or serve it with a grilled chicken. Absolutely delicious. Or chickpeas that you can, you know, add into a soup to bulk it up to all of a sudden make a beautiful minestrone or like my bella bean casserole dish, which was one of the first dishes I did on Instagram during lockdown and one of the most popular ones, which is all different types of pulses, chickpeas, cannellini beans, um, kidney beans, all popped in there um, with lots of tomato in there and green vegetables slowly cooked down. You've got a gorgeous, healthy, you know, beautiful casserole dish. You can serve it rice or even next day over a baked potato um, and things that you can you know, freeze ahead as well, um, which are you know, very useful as well. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of the things in my store cupboard. Um, and then grains, of course, and lentils, like for making dolls. I've got a gorgeous recipe in there for coconut milk spinach dal, which takes, oh my God, I mean, I would love it right now, now that I think of it. <laughs> like a big, comforting Indian coconut dal. And they just, they're cinched to make it. Red lentils is all you really need from it, and coconut milk, add in spinach and some spices, and you've got this beautiful dish. Yeah, it sounds lovely. We had a question um, about breakfast ideas and the book really focuses on weeknights, but I know on your Instagram, even recently, you've posted some breakfast. You made French toast, I think, for Valentine's Day. So are, are there sort of breakfast ideas that you have for folks as well? Um, yeah, definitely. And there's, there is tons actually on my um, on my Instagram because I went through a phase during lockdown of every Sunday doing um, a, sun, a, a brunch every Sunday. Um, I, and then also actually in the book, there's the, um, Pevas Rancheros, which actually works really well, um, as, uh, as a brunch, but also as a supper in the evening. And that's when you get like a big, like your largest frying pan that you have in the house, add, you know, sweat down some onions and garlic, add in tinged, you know, chopped tomatoes or cherry tomatoes, um, and then add in some lovely chili the chili flakes I was talking about earlier, the dried chili flakes, mm -hmm. and then crack in some eggs into it. And then you can add in a little bit of spinach or herbs if you want to, or fredded cheese into the oven for what, about 12 minutes and you've got a beautiful brunch dish. Um, funny, I was talking about French toast last night in bed. I was thinking, oh, I want French toast this weekend. And French toast is so simple to make. I mean, nice big chunky slice of bread, and then you just dip it in a bowl of milk that's whipped up with cinnamon and eggs, soak it in it, and then fry it off, maple syrup, crispy bacon, oh, and you're done. Oh, that sounds fantastic. I should have had my dinner before this event. Because it's <laughs> what time is it now? It's like 20 past seven over here. Or I said, Oh, I'll have my supper after the event. And I'm sorry. <laughs> so excited about the food <laughs> well, if you're so inclined you can just get up and make yourself something while we chat that's okay I'm sure I'm sure people wouldn't mind <laughs> and another one on the brunch which actually works as a brunch and also a supper and I make it for supper a lot you know is the gooey gruyere omelet um, oh yeah and I, and I put that in and, and and I was on I was kind of hemming and hawing about do I put in an omelet and then I thought well I do cook an omelet for supper probably at least once every three weeks and and so we spent a lot of time over in the kitchen in the evenings perfecting how to make the perfect omelet. Like, how do you get it really fluffy? How do you get it really creamy and gooey? That perfect timing so that when you open it up, it's like the goo of the cheese comes out because so often it can be dry or blah, blah, blah. Um, and by adding a little, you know, a tablespoon of cream into your mixture, adding in the Gruyere cheese into it, and not overcooking it. It can be really, really beautiful supper or a brunch as well. Yeah. So Jane in St. Paul, hello, Jane, thank you for joining us, um, asks, I'm a vegetarian. How much of the book has meat, including fish? The book sounds perfect if it has some vegetarian recipes. She's not vegan. Oh, that's so funny. I literally just opened this up. I'm going to show it to her. Um, <laughs> Vegalette. Um, it's just so beautiful of butternut squash, feta and olives. Um, so there's so many gorgeous vegetarian dishes in here. I actually have a whole free, meat-free section. 
there's a whole section that's dedicated to that. But even outside of that, I have, there's so many other ones, like the Bella Bean casserole that I was just talking about, or the Huevas Rancheros dishes that I was talking about, or this one, which is gorgeous as well, the Thai curry noodles. Oh my God, and that's with butternut squash as well in it. I love Thai curry noodles. So there's loads. Yeah, I was really impressed with just the, the breadth of recipes in terms of the flavors as well. And I think it's just such a good reflection of one, how much um, I think all of us sort of reach for different kinds of ingredients than we did even 10 years ago on a, on a weekly basis. Yeah. And how wonderful access we have to things like that. But also oh, wow. how if someone is, has like, you know, sort of preconceived ideas about what Irish English cooking might be, <laughs> This will sort of fly in the face of that in terms of um, it's a it's a much broader palette, I think, than people expect. Yeah, yeah we have come along. And actually, here's a picture of the Huevas Rancheros. I'd love to show people so they can really see what it looks like. It's so yummy. Oh, I love it. Oh, I'd love that right now. Was it kind of like <laughs> Sorry. It sounds no, so it's funny. Was it kind of like Tuesday yesterday where you guys were? Do you celebrate Pancake Tuesday? We don't celebrate Pancake Tuesday. Um, my oh. husband is my husband is British, and so we do as a family usually. But I was not at home, so I was like actually kind of sad to miss Pancake Day. But tell our audience for people who don't celebrate it about Shrove Tuesday or Pancake Day. Yeah. So since I was born, every Tuesday in Ireland and the UK, we make pancakes all day long. And I mean, last night we made eight, and there's just two of us, we ate them all up. I started making pancakes yesterday morning at like nine in the morning. I was obviously filming for my Instagram as well, but it's such a huge thing um, in, you know, growing up and you make them really, really thin. And um, so they're like crispy, thin they're pancakes. Like crepes more, I think, Americans, I think would think of them more like crepes than pancakes, but yeah, sorry. Really right, Laura. That's exactly it. Yeah. So they're really thin crepe crepes. Um, we call them pancakes. We call them crepes. And then you just roll them up, and then you put like a sprinkle of caster, super fine sugar on it, and um, squeeze of lemon. Or you can have them with jam or maple syrup. Or oh my god, I love them. Love them. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to bring it to America. I know. And well, you know Mardi Gras, right? So it's like I think. I mean, I don't know how much outside of New Orleans Mardi Gras is sort of celebrated here, but it's that same idea. It's that like, you know, sort of eat up and celebrate while you can before Lent, right? Is kind of the, yeah. the yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, Caitlin or Catlin, I'm sorry. I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, which way you pronounce it. What traditional Irish dish do you most like to eat? Or are there any dishes from your childhood that bring you comfort? Mm, besides the pancakes. Um, yeah, there's, can I say two? Cause they kind of go together. Uh, there's definitely an Irish stew. I mean, I love a good Irish stew. I was making it on television um, last week, a show here called ITV This Morning, which is our daytime show here in the UK. Um, in, and I like to make it with the, the, the bones on the lamb. So like lamb chops or lamb cutlets. Um, I put pearl barley in there too. Um, and carrots and potatoes and leeks and stock and I let it simmer away for about two hours and herbs in there and then I make a bread um, called my rosemary clover bread um, it was named by a friend of mine before I didn't name it a bread after myself just in case people <laughs> think walking around with a big ego um, but it's basically my take on the traditional Irish soda bread. It's a little bit crumblier and a little bit healthier and easier to make. Um, it's made with um, whole meal or whole grain flour and an all purpose flour, about two thirds whole grain and one third all purpose. And then you add in yogurt and milk and fresh rosemary. And I call it my stir, shape and bake bread because there's no kneading involved. There's no proofing, there's no waiting around. You use bicarbonate soda, which is think we call baking soda, to make it rise. Um, and you can, once you get into a rhythm of making it, it's so brilliant. Um, and if anybody out there has never made bread before or wants to start making bread or interested in bread, you've got to make this bread. It's just the best. It could become a number one in your house. 
it's so brilliant. That's that's cool. Cool. And I used to break the scoop into the um the the Irish stew. Mm. No, of course. We've all got to do it on St. Patrick's Day. Well, I was just going to say, so are there any specific things, because we're just a month away, right? It Actually, a month from today, from St. Patrick's Day. So what what other kinds of things do you like to make for that holiday? Oh, my God, so many. Um, my whiskey, salted caramel bread and butter pudding. Um, so that would be dessert. The whiskey, salted caramel bread and butter pudding. Do I have a picture of it anywhere? I don't. Um, that is so delicious. It's basically a caramel, salted caramel sauce that you make with whiskey in it. And then the bread um, and butter pudding is um, bread buttered, cut into quarters, sliced into quarters, and then you layer them on top of each other. And then you make like a custard mix of milk and eggs and cinnamon and raisins, and you pour it all over it. You bake it in the oven. It comes out like puffed up kind of souffle yeah. like and then you pour the salted whiskey caramel sauce over it. I mean, that so sounds good. incredible. That could be the meal as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that would be the meal. That, oh my <laughs> God, that's so good. <laughs> oh, so yeah, that's St. Patrick's Day. Irish stew, co rosy coated bread, and the bread and butter pudding. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <sighs> so, um, I thought it might be useful um, just for some folks um, who maybe this might be their, you know, sort of their, uh, your, the first time they're buying one of your books or they're sort of newer to you as sort of a, a, a cook and things like that. Tell us a little bit about just sort of how you got started and, um, and just a little bit about your background. Um, so I was born in, um, in Ireland, in Cork, which is um, a small town in the south of Ireland. Um, and when um, I used to spend my summers um, as a French exchange program in France, I went over when I was 12 and I loved it so much. Um, and I loved the family so much that they got me coming back for the whole summer. So the first time I went when I was 12, I only went for two weeks with French family. The big thing in, in Europe, in the UK and Ireland, that you do exchanges when you're younger. So I went over for two weeks and then the French girl came back to my house for two weeks. Um, and then they asked me if I wanted to stay for the whole summer the next year. And I did. So I spent every summer with them. I learned so much about French cooking. We're absorbed so much from um, the Ronza family, it was their name, and they lived in Rennes, um, which is in Brittany. And I learned so much from from the mom there was a stay-at-home mom and she was an amazing cook and it's so funny is that you don't realize what you're absorbing when you're young yeah until you're older and then all of a sudden I'm so fortunate like that people like you ask me questions and so it makes me dig into you know, you know things I've done when I was a kid and everything and that was amazing it's such a big thing for me growing up um and then like at our own home um at home in Ireland, every Saturday morning, we used to have like the baking. So we'd spend like three or four hours baking. Um, and my two elder sisters, Maraid and Neil, and my brother Jim and my mom, we'd all be in the kitchen baking. And it was for, not for like, oh, let's make little cookies. It was literally like, okay, so we've got to get, you know, the soda breads made. You've got to get your cinnamon rock ones done for the week. We'll make a sponge this week. Um, what we need to make some scones. We need them for school during the week. It was a real practical baking session. Um, and, and then it was a time in Ireland when I was young where there weren't the ready-to-go meals. Like I remember the first time my mother brought home a ready-to-go meal. I think I was probably maybe 13 or 14. And it was like, oh my God, the most <laughs> amazing thing we ever walked into our house. <laughs> but until then, it was always just, you know, stews and delicious warming hearty soups and things like that um, and then when I was 18 um, I went to university in America to NYU I studied marketing um, and then when I came back to Ireland I decided to do a cookery course because my idea was that there were no cafes in um, in Ireland at the time like there was no Starbucks or anything like that you right. couldn't like no such thing as like a cappuccino or anything like that. And, and so I thought, oh my God, 
I'm going to set up a chain of, you know, of coffee shops around Ireland, but I need to know about food. I need to know more about food. So I went to Ballymaloo um, um, Cookery School, which is also in Cork and a very special place and where we first met. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and, and I went there and literally after a couple of days, I never, ever, ever thought about that business plan again. I completely <laughs> fell in love with food. I fell in love with the whole Ballymaloo philosophy, you know, of, you know, farm to fork, um, and, and all of that. And I was spent, so I did my cookery course, went on and trained as a chef there. And then I left there to run farmers markets and set up farmers markets around Ireland. And that was a project that I did for about four or five years. And when I was in the middle of doing that, a lot of things happened. Um, it was an amazing time in Ireland because it was like this huge food revolution was happening. And um, I was so young, I was in my twenties and it was very exciting. And you know, all of a sudden we went from having six farmers markets to over a hundred farmers markets within those years. Um, and, uh, and it was just a really exciting time. It was nothing about making money. It wasn't anything about like trying to get on TV or there was no social, real social media. I mean, I certainly didn't have any social media. And it was just a really organic, natural time of how can we get more producers producing food, more farmers making something from their mill, blah, blah, blah. And how can we encourage them to get to market via farmer's market that is part of a community that keeps this wonderful eco system going within a community and also, you know, helps the community in a financial way as well. So it's keeping all of the revenue within the thing. There, I mean, the farmer's market, a proper farmer's market in a town will make a town because it supports all the farmers around mm -hmm. and really in Ireland, which is an agricultural country, that is the heartbeat of the, of, of the island, of the country. And so I did that. And while I was doing that, I, um, so I've done so many things in my, in my, in my <laughs> life so far, so crazy. But when I was doing that, Darina and Jane Ferguson, who is a cheesemaker who makes this wonderful cheese called Gabine, said to me. You mean Darina Allen from Ballymaloo? Yes, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, that's okay. Um, and, and Jane Ferguson, who's an amazing um, uh, cheesemonger and activist and everything. And she, they both said to me, will you help with setting up Slow Food Ireland? And Slow Food is an organization that helps to promote um, exactly what I was talking about, the farmers markets, you know, um, keeping food history alive, food culture within local communities, that's really the essence of it. Um, and, and so I did, I got involved with them and I started uh, running Slow Food Ireland and doing events for them and I did little guides and everything. And then Slow Food in Italy offered me a position in the university in Italy. So I went over there worked there for three years um, and worked with um, all kind of non, like non-speaking Italian students. So it's, it's students that were coming from all abroad and I'd bring them around and show them, we'd go to visit all different producers and everything. And that was like the most amazing three years of learning about Italian food that I, was one of the best moves I've ever made in for life reasons, for my food, you know, my food knowledge. Um, like now when I talk about making a pasta, I'm like transported immediately back to Italy and how it's authentically made there. Yeah. Um, and so then I came back and I set up restaurants in, Ar in Ireland, three of them. And I did that for seven years. And then for anybody out there who's got a restaurant, you know what I mean by I got slightly burnt out from the restaurant. It was just exhausting. Um, and I'm somebody who doesn't engage lightly in something. I'm all or nothing. So, was, <laughs> you know, I was in the restaurant all the time, it was seven days a week. And, um, uh, and I felt like I was losing my attachment to um, my creativity in a funny way, because all of a sudden I became into like, stock taking and everything um and so i made a move moved to london and 
um, started back writing cookery books. Um, and, and then I wrote Coda's Suppers and then I wrote Coda's Weeknight Kitchen and, and I met Harry, my fiance, who I know is watching. Hi. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and he, and we moved in together about three years ago into this beautiful place called Broadspear. Um, yeah. And, um, and yeah, it's been like a, a fantastic project for us yeah. um, over the past few years. It was, it's a very old piece of property, which sits within a very um, big park called High Clear Park, um, which has been in my fiance's family for generations. And, and so we have a small little kind of like little plot and a, a lovely cottage and the walled garden was, was, was in kind of in disarray. And so we brought it back to life and it's now a fully working vegetable and fruit garden and a pergola in the middle of it. And um, we started an orchard. So we've got 32 varieties of fruit trees. Um, we have bees. The bees is actually one of the first things that we did when we came here because we were like, we really need to encourage the bees here and be pollinating before we even think about, you know, adding in more trees or vegetables. And so we have our own honey, which is amazing. Um, and it's lovely seeing the bees swarm everywhere happily. Um, and we have hens. So we've got the most gorgeous six perfect brown hens. And for those who follow me on Instagram, I know how much you love them. <laughs> you love them more than me. I mean, it's amazing. People are very attached to the hens um, and they're gorgeous um, and they lay eggs for us every day and they click around the place. And when we go over to feed them and open up their, they have a little whole kind of area, but then we let them go out everywhere as well. And the eat, you know, before they go to bed at night, they get to wander around everywhere. Um, and they follow us around everywhere. They're like running after us everywhere, like little, like little lamb. <laughs> It's gorgeous and their names are Kenneth Paltrow, um, we have uh, um, Eggy Pop, um, <laughs> we have um, a Dixie Chick, um, we have Saoirse, which means freedom in Irish, I have to have an Irish name in there. We have Tina after Tina Turner, because there's one who's very bossy in there. Um, and, oh my God, I'm forgetting one name. Um, oh, it'll come to me in a second. It'll come to me in a second. I blame it on. That's okay. Uh, Everybody has COVID brain. Yeah, don't worry. I do um, that with children, so it's okay. You can <laughs> forget your chicken's name. That's okay. <laughs> um, no, I was just going to say, and you've you've launched a gin recently, I think. Yeah, so I launched, um, I have my gin here. I always have it close by. So, yeah, so <laughs> if I chew, you, you can't get this in America, unfortunately. Um, but about two years ago, I made um, uh, these wonderful people who live um, in Ireland and produce an amazing gin. I was doing a big supper in, in London um, using all different Irish produce. And I used this gin making um, a gravlax, like a salmon gravlax. Mm. And I loved it so much. And they came over and we had a cup of tea, as you do, very, very Irish. Irish person comes to visit England and you have to have them in for a cup of tea um, and we were chatting and we really bonded and they said would you like to come over to Ireland and spend you know a few days foraging and create your own gin you know it was just for myself and so I was like oh my god you know what I actually have a couple of days free next week I'm just going to go for it and do it and so I went over and spent a couple of days with them and the most amazing days out um, on the coast of Ireland foraging for all different botanicals and mm. it was such an amazing experience it was like creating a recipe well it was creating a recipe yeah and so we made um yeah we made this gin and it they called me a couple of weeks later saying it tastes so good we're going to send you the batch they sent me the batch and then um, we started selling it so we sell it here in the uk and ireland and hopefully it will be available in america this year at some point Oh, wow. So what were some of the botanicals that you felt like were sort of distinctive that that we might experience if we get to taste your gin someday? Um, um, Alexander seed um, mm. is this wonderful seed that grows wild um, in Ireland and it tastes like um, aniseed, mm. um, beautiful um, licorice aniseed flavor. Um, and then the other one is brookworth. Um, it's like an orange.
orange berry that's quite sour um, that grows on the seashore of Ireland. Um, and that was absolutely beautiful in there. Um, and then the other one then is um, fir, which comes from a tree, which is like a green little kind of stemmy thing. You'd see it, it looks a little bit like a Christmas tree, but it's not. Okay. Um, and, and it brings that wonderful kind of mossy flavor to it. It's, it's a very savory drink with those kind of like hints of like citrus in it as well. Um, it's not a sweet gin, it's a savory gin, which I prefer. So it's more like a London dry gin. Yeah, yeah. Than, yeah. It's a real gin drinker's gin. That's what people say. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, one comment from Kat who says it tastes amazing. So someone's got oh it. Oh my God, that's Kat McCoy. She's tuning in for Hi, Kat. <laughs> so um, if you have any questions, we've got just a few minutes left. So make sure you jump into the Q&A button to ask those. Um, so you've managed to write a book during lockdown, which is Yay. amazing. What are you most looking forward to doing after you can sort of, I hate to say go back to normal because I think it's going to be this very gradual thing, but when you can leave your house safely again, like what are you most looking forward to doing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. the first thing I'm doing is going to Ireland to see my mom um, and then just spend time in Ireland because I miss home so much. Um, and then the next thing that I'm looking forward to doing is planning our wedding because <laughs> we got engaged. Um, so doing that and, and seeing friends um, like Kat, who I know is watching, I'd love to come to New York and see her and, you know, just getting back to life and, and, and visiting places you no know, luckily that we're so close to you know the rest of Europe so you know just getting on the train and doing the Euro tunnel and going to Europe and just being immersed in different cultures yeah yeah and um we have a question about sort of your next projects we talked a little bit about some things you're working on before we got started so maybe you want to share some things with the audience yeah. Um, yeah, so I started um, an online shop when I was doing the IGTV and see, I see all these beautiful candles here. They're all, um, they're all made from wax um, and they're made about an hour and a half from here. So they're beautiful, sustainable candles um, and beautiful glasses and which are, are these ones? Yeah, these ones are on it. All like beautiful hand-blown glasses. And we do beautiful like wicker baskets and um, like all my utensils that I use. I set up an online shop and so everything that I use at home when I was doing my IGTV, people were asking me, where can I buy it? Like, where can I buy it? Where can I buy it? And so I started slowly sourcing really beautiful things and we created this gorgeous online shop and like, or it's so bizarre the things that are like number one sellers, which I'm sure you get a kick out of too, you know, for your shop is um, like, or bread or linen. We've got these beautiful linen bread bags that we sold out of, you know, a few weeks ago, <laughs> like within three hours when I was on TV and somebody mentioned how good the bread bag was. And I was like, oh yeah, they're amazing. Because we do them in all these beautiful colors and we sold out in three hours. And then we had to get <laughs> a new shipping back that came in. And we had a list of people that we had to email the, the other day going, they're back in stock, they're back in stock. Um, and yeah, so that's really fun. I love doing that. Like I love curating beautiful, people who follow me on Instagram will know, I love creating beautiful tablescapes. Um, and so we stock all of those things like the beautiful linens and all the rest and, and these gorgeous, um, do I have any, oh yeah, all these beautiful um, potteries that are made in London. You could stock them in book larder. Um, <laughs> they're all these beautiful handmade pottery dishes for olives and plates and everything that, sort of, that are made in London. Um, and so yeah, all little special things like that, but I just, it's my other passion besides cooking. <laughs> yeah, no, you have beautiful things on your website for sure. And I also appreciate that you have so many cookbooks always behind you in your, in your videos. Who are some of your influences and what are some of your favorite books? Oh my God, two of my favorites. Um, Darina, Darina Allen, I love her. Um, I also love uh, Nigel Slater for his recipes. I love Alice Waters. She's so amazing. Um, I love her recipes. Um, who else do I love? 
Um, well, I'm looking at them there. My friend Thomasina Myers, she's here in the UK. She's a concentrates on Mexican food, which I love. Um, Rosie Bamford, or Cry Bamford is very good. Um, Otto Lenghi, Jamie Oliver. I mean, Rick Stein, I love Rick Stein, and he's yeah. a good friend as well. Um, oh, got so many. I'm, I've got loads more books, that's why I'm looking over the computer. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. I just I love cookery books. I absolutely love them. Um, Tessa Kiros is a really good book. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful books, doesn't she? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, all kinds of suppers. You know the Sunday suppers, Karen Moden. Mm. You know the Sunday suppers mm -hmm. in New York? Um, Karen, oh God, I can never remember her last night. Moden to me. Um, I mean, a lot of them. Anyway, I could go on about cookery books. Yeah, yeah. Well, it must be so fun having your, your bookshop, is it? What's that? Sorry? It must be so fun running a bookshop. Oh, it's loads of fun. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, yeah, I'm surrounded by cookbooks at home and at work all the time. So yeah, it's it's delightful from that perspective, for sure. Yeah. Um, coming back to your book, what are some of the things that, um, you know, you said you use it yourself. So what are you going to make after we're done here? And what are some of the things that you're planning to make at this sort of winter time? What are your favorite recipes from the book? Uh, well, actually, tonight we're making carbonara. So that's very easy to make. Um, and it's, I absolutely love it. It's crispy pancetta um, with garlic. Um, and then in a separate bowl, you put egg yolks in with creme fraiche, a dash of cream, parmesan cheese, crisp up your bacon with the garlic, add it into that, all into the greeny, wrap it around, it's absolutely delicious. Yeah. Um, oh God, what will I make tomorrow night? I'll probably do, or I can't do another pasta dish tomorrow. I might do the spinach dog. You can do pasta tomorrow. every night, that's okay. <laughs> we have time, we have weeks like that in my house, I think. <laughs> I've got so many pasta dishes in here, like the pasta and more, which is basically cacio e pepe. I mean, yeah, that looks great. That's such a great recipe, Cacio e Pepe. Yeah. For those who know, it's pecorino um, and lots of black pepper um, and butter in your pasta. I mean, it's so good. I also love this prawn lasca with rice noodles. Like, I love mm. rice noodles. I love fish. Um, so I, I, I you know, cook a lot of um, fish dishes as well. I have a fat Spanish fish stew in here spring green curly barley risotto um which i know i'm making on saturday i'm doing a radio show based around it which will be really fun and curly barley risotto is really nice so here's the here's the carbonara and this one has butternut squash in it so if anybody has never made has ever not made butternut carbonara with butternut squash they have to try it it's so good together it makes gives this wonderful caramely richer flavor mm, to the yeah yeah i hadn't thought of that that's a great idea yeah it's beautiful um yeah there's there's a lot there's lots <laughs> all right so you obviously you know brand new book people can find you on instagram where else should they be looking for you and what you're up to um it's funny isn't it like instagram is now like the kind of hub of everything so anything that i'm ever going to do i always put it first on instagram and then my yeah. website closingmckenna.com where my shop is and where we keep all the other recipes that you might be. So if you get this book and you love this book and you want some other inspiration, you can definitely get more recipes there. Or for your St. Patrick's Day menu, I'll, I'll hit you up. Oh, wonderful, for sure. I want that bread pudding recipe. Yeah, definitely. Right. I'll try to these with you. You can have it for your website. You could do a St. Patrick's Day menu. Oh, we would love that. That would be really, yeah. really lovely for sure. I'll take, I will follow up with you on that for sure. Okay, well, everybody needs to go to the Book Larder website for their St. Patrick's <laughs> Well, and Cloda's website. That's all right. So Cloda's book is Cloda's Weeknight Kitchen. As I said, it's available at booklarder.com. Cloda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And um, congratulations on your book. And I hope um, everyone stays safe and healthy and that we'll all get to see each other in person at some point in the not too distant future. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care.